John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So we've reached the end of verse 3 in our study, and here Jesus clarifies what God we have to know if we will have eternal life. It is popular to think that if you have faith in any God, or um, as people at the hospital often say to me, I definitely believe in a higher power, um, that if you have some kind of faith in a higher power, then you are a person of faith and you will be okay. But Jesus gives specific statements about the God whom we must know, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So I want to ask seven questions as we begin this morning. And for the first four of these, they go together and you're welcome to answer out loud. These are not trick questions. And those of you who are taking notes, don't try to write these down. Okay, you can write down the others, but not these four. First of all, number one, do you believe that there is only one God? All right. Number two, do you believe that the one who sent Jesus Christ is the true God? Okay, number three, do you believe that the Son of God came to earth as Jesus? Okay, and number four, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Okay. Eric, Pastor Eric, do we have a closing hymn? we could finish with, we all <laughs> agree. You know, I, I, I grew up in a Christian home. I mean, I, I, was, I was in church uh, all day long as an infant because there was a Christian school at our church and my mom was a teacher and so she put me in a crib in the corner while she taught when I was a newborn. So you realize I have learned theology since I was a newborn. And so, Christian kid, there's no such thing as a Christian kid, right? Okay, but kid going up in a Christian home, growing up in a Christian home as I was, the end of John 17, 3 is potentially boring for me because I know all this stuff already. One God, would I get excited about being told, you know what the pastor's going to preach on today? He's going to preach about how there's only one God. And I would say, whoa, this is going to be good. I've never heard this before. No, I've heard this one true God, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Okay, so now, I've asked you four questions. We all agree. We've considered the possibility of ending the service now. Let me ask you three more questions about those four questions. Okay? Three questions about those four questions. Don't, don't answer these out loud, please. First of all, and if you're taking notes, you're welcome to write these down. Uh, can we be confident that everyone who answered those four questions positively or affirmatively has eternal life? And of course the answer is no. Eternal life is knowing God, and knowing God is much more than knowing a set of facts. Now, it's not less than knowing facts. There are truths that you have to know about God and the gospel, but it's much more than just knowing facts. It is a real relationship with God that begins now when Jesus fixes your shattered relationship with God through the cross, right? So just rattling off true facts about God doesn't mean that we have eternal life. But let's reverse that now in another question. Can someone who answered no to those four questions have eternal life? Can someone who answered no to those four questions have eternal life? Now, you might say that there's someone who hasn't learned every detail of theology yet and they're still ignorant about some things. Maybe they don't know what the word Christ means or something. Okay, grant those things. But if someone rejects those four things, can they have eternal life? No. Okay? Now, last question. What if you sometimes doubt some of those things? What if you sometimes doubt some of those things? Do you ever say to yourself, is there really a God? Was Jesus really who he claimed to be? 
You ever ask yourself those questions? You ever look at your Bible and say, I wonder if this is actually from God or not? It got really quiet in here. Um, I will be glad to tell you, I ask those questions all the time. I regularly find myself saying, okay, really? Why do I believe that's true? Is that really true? So we could look at the end of John 17, 3 and say, oh, we know and believe this stuff already. But we could also be honest that sometimes we ask, really? Is that true? I want to make sure you understand that this is normal at times. Hopefully not all the time, but normal at times. That's why the Bible refers to faith as a fight. A fight. It's a battle. Your faith will be under siege at times. It's okay to ask questions. It can be really healthy to go back and remind yourself, why do I believe this again? So please do not feel ashamed if you have some doubt about a core truth of Christianity. Remember that church is not a spiritual fashion show where we all come and show off our strong faith and perfect obedience. We often don't have strong faith, and we never have perfect obedience, so there is no reason to pretend it is so. We gather as sinners, sometimes struggling, sometimes doubting. And you don't need to be ashamed when your faith is under attack. Now, there's a lot more I could say about those times, but I want to mention just one more thing this morning because it really sets us up for the other truths we're going to talk about here. When you are doubting or questioning, please make sure you keep seeking the Lord. God rewards those who diligently seek Him. Get the facts. Work hard. Learn. And I say this because in our culture, it is cool to celebrate everybody's ideas about God or God's or spirituality. I read recently about a church where they, they do this. Actually, I met a man who goes to a church like this. They'll have maybe like an, an Indian ritual for how they walk in. They'll, they'll read an ancient Hindu poem. They'll, they'll be burning some incense. They'll read a prayer from a Roman Catholic prayer book. They'll have a Buddhist meditation, and they'll read some Bible verses. And basically what they're saying is, I'm not willing to work to try to find truth. Imagine a young lady who's nearing her wedding day, and you ask her, so who are you marrying? And she says, oh, I'm not worried about that. Any guy will do. (laughs) And you say, well, okay, you can at least tell me what his name is. And she says, "Ah, I'm not concerned about that. Any name is nice, right? And you say to her, well, what is he like? And she says, ah, that doesn't really matter. Any type of guy is fine. You would say she's crazy, but that's what people today do with truth. Oh, doesn't matter. Anything's fine. Sure, that's great. Sounds good. So when you are doubting or questioning, don't do that. Don't be lazy. Seek the Lord, pursue truth, ask hard questions. You know, the foundational conviction that drives what we do as a church and what I do as a pastor is the belief that the Bible can take it. I would never be a Bible teacher if I didn't believe the Bible can take any question we ask. I've had, and honestly, I've had to grow in this. Again, as the kid growing up in the Christian home, you you go through a point in your life where you're like defensive, like, like, you hear any questions or doubts or anybody who criticizes the Bible and you go into panic mode, right? And I've had to mature to the point where I realize, say whatever you want, ask whatever you want, bring it on, right? I'm not afraid of the Bible. You don't need to be afraid of what the Bible says. You don't have to have chapters and verses and parts of the Bible that, ooh, we just stay away from because I don't know what that means, right? The Bible can take your hard questions and... uh, By the way, there are some great resources in the church library to help 
And any of your pastors would be delighted if you came to us and said, I don't even know if I believe this is true. I mean, that, we would far rather you come and say that than you keep coming to church, you do the fashion show every Sunday morning, and nobody has any idea what you're really thinking. What a mess that is, right? So please, please, let's wrestle through, fight through our temptations and our doubts together with honesty and humility and openness, okay? All right, now, that was a long introduction. Let's work our way through these words of Jesus. First of all, in verse 3, we come to the word only, that they may know you the only God. God chose to reveal himself on earth, first of all, through the nation of Israel. And there, as we read this morning, their foundational confession in Deuteronomy 6.4 was that Yahweh is one, the one God, the only God. But that belief was contrary to the belief of the Egyptians, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, who all accepted uh, the idea of multiple gods. And still today, well over a billion people worship more than one God. But the God of the Bible says, before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. I am Yahweh, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. And if there's only one God, isn't that what you expect him to say? Not, you know, I'm actually the only God, but I don't care if you think there are other gods. Worship whatever you want. It doesn't matter. If there's only one God, he's going to insist that he is the only God. The next word Jesus uses is true, the true God. That might seem redundant, like if he's the only God, then obviously he's the true God. But many people believe in one God who's not the true God. But the true God means the only one who is really God, authentically, genuinely God. So what about the God portrayed in the Quran? Is he the authentic, genuine God? What about the Om, the universal spirit that permeates all of us? Is that the authentic God? What about the Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother of Mormonism who were once a man and a woman like you and I? What about the God whom I heard one famous Jewish rabbi uh, describe, whom you, who, who needs you to forgive him, okay, this God, needs you to forgive him for the big mess he's made in this world. Is that the authentic God? This week, uh, some of you probably saw this head- headline, the PCUSA, which is the largest Presbyterian denomination in the United States, decided not to include the hymn in Christ alone in their updated version of their hymn book because they can't don't like that line about the wrath of God being satisfied in Christ. So what God is their God? Is he the authentic God? Jesus told the Samaritan woman that the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. John 7, 28, Jesus said one of the most galling things he could possibly have said in the temple in Jerusalem. He cried out, he who sent me is true, whom you do not no. By the way, if you want to not live very long, walk into the temple and tell the Jews that they, they don't know the true God, right? Because they were serious about only one God, yet Jesus said, you don't know him. You can be very religious and yet not know the true God and not have eternal life. And again, if If there is one true God, we expect him to say, I'm the truth, believe in me, alone, nothing else, nobody else. And so he calls us, 1 Thessalonians 1.9, to turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God. So to have eternal life, you must know the only true God. But then if you look back at the verse, you must also know Jesus Christ, whom you, the only true God, the Father, has sent. This phrase has been controversial since the earliest centuries of the Christian church because some have said that this proves that Jesus must not be God since here in John 17, 3, Jesus and the only true God are separated. And so um, the most famous uh, is, is Arius, 
uh, in the, but, but even before that, um, this verse was used, and then certainly it's used by, by our cult um, friends today who want to argue that Jesus cannot be God. And, and really, to say that, to say that John 17, 3 says that Jesus is not God, um, misses the, the point in the Gospel of John that Jesus came to the Jewish people who believed that they could believe in the one true God and reject Jesus, right? That's what they insisted on. We don't need you. We already know the one true God. And so throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus insisted that if they were going to know the one true God, they were going to have to accept the one whom he had sent, like we just saw in John 7. You don't know the true God who sent me. Or John 15, 23, he who hates me hates whom? My father also. So, so the point is not that Jesus is not God, but that the Jews could not believe in the one true God and yet reject the Messiah whom he sent. To reject Jesus was to reject God. And that's true for anyone today that says, I, I know God, I have a relationship with God, I just don't believe in the Bible, or I just don't believe in Jesus, or I'm not a Christian, I don't believe in Christianity, but I know God. I, I, have, I, I believe in a higher power, I'm okay with God. And that um, can't be... So, so John 17, 3 teaches us that knowing and believing in Jesus is a necessity. Okay? The, the world must know about Jesus. The world must hear the word of Christ. Bibles have to be translated. Missionaries have to be sent. Each follower of Jesus must share the word of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And Peter said, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men whereby we can be saved. And Paul said, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Remember Paul's words that we finished with last week, some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. The knowledge of Jesus is necessary for anyone to have eternal life. And so that's why we look for every opportunity to share the truth. Now we come to the phrase, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. When the Son of God came as a man, his parents were instructed to give him an earthly name, and they didn't get to choose. Uh, they were told to name him Jesus, which is a shortened form of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. By the way, this is another reason why we need to use this name Yahweh, because it's part of Jesus' name. Joshua means Yahweh is salvation, and Jesus is just a shortened form of the Hebrew Joshua. So the Son of God was given the Hebrew name, which means Yahweh saves. And then we have the word Christ, God's anointed one or Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament hope that for Israel, God would send a deliverer. And what is so important here is that this is the only time when it's recorded that Jesus ever referred to himself as the Christ. Now, certainly Jesus had not denied it, <laughs> When Peter said, you are the Christ, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Peter, my father revealed this to you. And when the high priest said, tell us if you're Christ, Jesus said, you said it yourself, right? So Jesus certainly knew he was the Christ and did not, did not deny that. But he didn't publicly use that title because he was not the political revolutionary that they expected or wanted. He came to appeal to hearts first and to uh, as those hearts understood their sin and need for a Savior, they could then be ready to understand what it meant that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the deliverer whom God sent to deliver from sin. So it's, it's never recorded anywhere else that Jesus directly called himself the Christ except here. Uh, so I'm reading a liberal commentator this week, and he says it is... Uh, what did he say? Just almost impossible or something that Jesus would have actually said this here because he wants to argue that John actually kind of summarized later and John kind of made Jesus say this. And I just thought, that is absurdity. Of all the times and places when you might expect Jesus to just directly refer to himself as the Christ, it would be right here. The last night before he dies, 
some of his last words before he dies with just these 11 closest of his followers. And in John 17, remember, he's stepping back and he's looking at the big picture of all that he and the Father are accomplishing in the world, of all the places where Jesus would refer to himself openly as the Christ. It would be right now. But this liberal guy says it's impossible, so John must have added it. Crazy. I don't know why I brought that up, but it frustrated me when I read it. All right. So Jesus Christ, as Jesus, he is Yahweh, our Savior. As Christ, he is the deliverer whom God has sent for our sin. Now, the final key word here is the word sent, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. First of all, this tells us that the only true God is active in this world. He's not a blind watchmaker. He's not a passive spectator. When the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son. He's actively working here. Now, we talked a moment ago about how the central issue for the Jews was whether or not they would believe that Jesus was truly the one sent from God. So in the Gospel of John, and I was startled to see this this week, though it makes sense, it's more than 40 times we read Jesus saying that he was the one sent from God because it was the central issue that the Jewish people had to settle in their own hearts. And right here in John 17, we see how important this is. If you look down at verse 8, look at how he describes his disciples to the Father. Verse 8, For the words which you gave me I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. That's what distinguished them. Look down at at verse 21. So he prays that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe what? That you sent me. And verse 23, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know what? That you sent me. Verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known, what do they know? That you sent me. So certainly... If you're going to know the one true God, you have to know him through Jesus. And if you don't believe that Jesus is the one who came to reveal the true God, you can't have eternal life. So this is, in a sense, you could say our message to the world is believe in Jesus, come to Jesus because he is the key to knowing God. He is the one sent by God so that you can know God. All right, so I think we've made it through those basic words there, only true God, Jesus Christ, and sent. If we will have eternal life and know God, we must know these things. Now, we started this morning talking about these big truths that we affirmed together. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we might be tempted to yawn and say we know there's only one God and that he sent Jesus, and that's like theologically having an adult count to 10. You know, it's, it's basic. But again, I want to bring us back now to this question. Really? What, what if these things are actually true? There's a difference between you knowing something since infancy and that something being true. What if these things are true? What if the explanation for planet Earth is not blind chance, but in the beginning, God created? What if this book, and I will call it an incredible book, what if this book is not the result of an elaborate hoax across a millennia, but what if this book actually exists because God has spoken? What what if the historical Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be? What if there is only one true God? Jesus says that if there is only one true God, then eternal life and death are at stake for me. Eternal life is to know him. What will I do with the word of God? What will I do with the Son of God? If those things are true, then eternal life and eternal death are at stake for me. Not only that, 
but also if there is only one true God, then he deserves all glory. Verse 1 says Jesus is going to glorify the Father. Verse 2 says he's going to do that by giving eternal life. And verse 3 says that eternal life is knowing the one true God through Jesus. If there's only one God, then only he is worthy of glory. And the longing of my heart should be that God would receive the glory that he deserves from all people, most of all from me. And this is what we find in the scriptures as the prayer of God's people, like 2 Kings 19. Oh, Yahweh, our God, I pray, deliver us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, oh, Yahweh, are God. The psalmist prays that God might deal with his enemies, that they may know that you alone, whose name is Yahweh, are the most high over all the earth. We should pray like that. God, help me respect my husband or love my wife or speak with grace to my kids or keep the faith or share the truth or resist temptation that people might know that I know the only true God, that people might know that you are the only true God, that you might be glorified through me. It's not only the prayer of God's people, it is also their praise. Romans 16, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. Timothy 1, now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in an approachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. By the way, do you see why we keep encouraging us that we need to become an amen in church. And Jude verse 25, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Oh, good. You see those, those amens at the end of every one of those are, are reflecting that the, the people who know the only God long for him to receive the glory that he deserves. Their, their hearts say amen when he alone is praised. Or when someone prays for his glory. The glory of God, of the only God, is not only the prayer and the praise of his people, it will also be the conclusion of this world's story. 1 Corinthians 15 says that God will be all in all. Revelation 15 verse 4, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you. Okay, the, the question of whether or not there is only one true God is a question of glory. You may be familiar a little bit with the atheist Richard Dawkins. Uh, in one of his books that's titled Unweaving the Rainbow, he talks about how we live on a planet that is, uh, he says, all but perfect for our kind of life. Compared with most planets, this is paradise. And he uses the word stupefying. He says the odds are stupefying that we would be here on this planet. And to try to explain uh, what those odds are like, he says, imagine that there are some explorers in a spaceship. They're the last of their race, and they are floating aimlessly through space, hoping against hope that they might find a planet that can sustain life. And by impossible luck, they find our earth. And he says, the story asks for too much luck. It would never happen, yet it is essentially what has happened to us. Not that we arrive by a spaceship, but that by some incredible luck, this planet is perfect for human life, and we are here. So Dawkins concludes that we are, and these are huge, his words, hugely blessed and privileged. Now, as you listen to that, doesn't it call for someone to receive glory? hugely blessed. By whom? It is ironic. There's this video on YouTube, and this is actually one of my family members shared this with me. There's actually this video on YouTube of Dawkins reading these excerpts from his book, and they set background music to it, and it's some Latin hymn of praise to Christ. But it's in Latin, so I'm sure they didn't know what they were doing. To Dawkins, there is no one to receive the glory there is no one who knows all things, no one with creative power, no one who has defeated death, 
No one who is always trustworthy. No one whose very nature is love. There is no shepherd. There is no king. There is no one who will never leave you nor forsake you. There is nothing but blind fate. Incredible chance, stupefying luck. Someone write a hymn in praise of stupefying luck. (laughs) The question of whether or not there is one God is a question of glory, a question of who gets the honor and the praise. And finally, we should add that it is not only a question of glory, but it is also a question of loyalty. When Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world for his worship, Jesus replied, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship Yahweh your God and serve him only. No one can serve two masters. The one who is God alone must be served alone. He must have our exclusive loyalty. So it's easy for me to nod my head and say, yes, I know there's only one true God and he sent Jesus Christ. But could my life be lived as a man who is loyal to him? Could I live as a man passionate for the glory of the one true God? Now maybe that sounds grandly impractical, but this has everything to do with diapers and work evaluations and term papers and flat tires and music lessons and dates and doctor's appointments and vacations. From him and through him and to him are all things. Everything in my life can matter. Everything has value. Everything has to do with glory. How I communicate with my wife has something to do with the glory of the only God and how I choose to spend my money, and what my attitude is toward that person I don't like very much, and what I do with my time on the weekend, and how I treat others when I'm sick. From Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things. I was created for good works, which the only true God foreordained that I should walk in them. It it all matters. I I don't have to wander through a meaningless life if He is the only God. It matters. It really, really matters. Your brief vapor of a life matters if you know the one true God through Jesus Christ whom He has sent. So may the one true God awaken me from my drowsiness that yawns at these truths and bring me back to the awe of the only true God who created me, called me, sustained me, saved me, welcomed me, uses me, loves me. If there's only one true God, and if I know him through Jesus Christ whom he has sent, then what does that mean? You could, this afternoon, take a piece of paper and write that question at the top of the page. Especially, especially those of you who've known about the only true God since you were three especially you, right at the top of the page. If it's really true, what does it mean? And then start writing. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. (laughs) And guess what Paul ended that with? Amen. Amen. I will close with this, uh, not typical prayer, but benediction from Jude. We read half of this earlier, but let's get the first half of it now. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.